Sunday morning sunlight hurt my eyes. It's a long way from where I've been back to my hometown. There's a man in me I need to drown. So baptize me. Good morning, church. We had to make our way through the fog and through the rain to get here this morning, but here we are. So we made it. So we might as well do a little worship, and what do you think? All right. Well, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. They tell me of a home far away They tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Whoa, they tell me of an unclouded day Come on! Whoa, the 
smiles on his children there. And his smiles drives the sorrows away. You tell me that no tears ever come again. In that lovely land of unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky.
that can heal a broken heart Meet you today standing right where you are He's Alpha Omega, beginning and end He's mercy and grace and His sinner's best friend He is love He is love He is love He is love Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Because All right. I got so consumed with that song, I forgot what I was to do next. So glad to have you here with us. And my all-time favorite thing to do as a church is to let a believer testify of his, and in this case, her faith in Christ Jesus. Whenever she comes to this water, he, she, we, or me, whenever we come to the water, the water doesn't do any saving. I hear people say, well, you know, I'm going to wash away all my sins and get baptized. We, we don't have that much water, my friend. We, we just don't, don't, don't realize that it can't do that. It was the blood of Christ that covers our sin. It was the death of Christ that pays for the debt of our sin. It's our faith in him that puts us in that relationship. But that doesn't mean that the water doesn't have an important part in a life of a believer. It's, it's very important. It's commanded that we do that. We're encouraged to do, do that. It will bring joy to the believer. And here are a few things that this water does do. Even if it doesn't save us, it does tell a wonderful testimony of what Christ did for us. Symbolic, whenever a believer comes into the water, it reminds us that Christ, even though he was God, emptied himself and became a child, became a man, and entered into this world. But not only does it symbolic of the fact that Christ came into this world, but whenever the believer is baptized in the water, lowered in the water, covered in the water, it's symbolic of the fact that Christ died for us. But the beautiful part of this testimony, whenever a believer comes up, it reminds us that the grave could not hold Christ, for Christ rose again with eternal life and abundant life to offer us. And so there it is, the resurrection life that it tells the story of Christ. But also, Jaden, this morning, whenever you come, you're going to be telling your story. You were living, trusting in yourself to be all right, to be with God. But there came a day whenever she realized that she, like us, is a sinner and couldn't fix her sin problem between her and God. But she realized that God had done for her what she couldn't do for himself, for herself. That even though she couldn't be perfect, Jesus was perfect. And even though she was deserving of a sinner's death, Christ took that death and bore her, bore her uh, justice and took care of that whenever he was crucified. So she put her faith in him. And upon putting her faith in that crucified and resurrected Lord, she became a new person in Christ Jesus, a Savior and Lord. Jaden, are we ready? You come. How old are you, Jaden? Seven years old. Isn't that neat? Got a whole life to live for Jesus. If you'll put your feet forward and sit straight down. Now, I know the answer to this, but I want all to hear this. Have you placed your faith in Jesus to be your Savior and to be your Lord? 
upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Woo. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Aren't you glad you came today? Yes, yes. Okay, so we've all kind of been comparing how much rain fell yesterday. So here's our scientific poll. Anybody get more than five inches? That would be us. Okay, how about six? Anybody get more than six? Okay, anybody get more than seven? Okay, y'all win. They win. <laughs> more than seven inches. But, you know, a lot of plans changed yesterday along with the rain. They even canceled the SEMO homecoming parade, which they haven't done in, you know, like since 1970 or something. But the amount of rain that we got caused a few problems. There were a lot of little signs on my way in this morning that said, water over road. So there were a lot of, you know, you had to reroute, change your plans, you know, even, you know, make some new ones. And it caused a few problems for folks. And when it comes to problems, if you're like me, whether it's flooding or if my whole life is coming unraveled, when we have problems, this is what I do. I look at the problem, I evaluate the problem, and then I formulate a plan. And then I pray and ask God to bless said plan. Anybody else do that? Yeah, we all do that. So maybe how we try to solve our problem is the problem. You know, there's a story in Isaiah chapter 36 about someone who had a problem probably greater than any we have faced. So the Assyrian army is encamped around Jerusalem, and King Hezekiah is in Jerusalem. And there are hundreds of thousands of armies, you know, part of his army and his men surrounding Jerusalem. And then what happens is the king of the Assyrian army sends a letter to Hezekiah, basically threatening destruction if they don't surrender. Here's what he said, Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely, and you think you'll be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? So then this letter is taken to King Hezekiah there in his palace. And he gets the letter, and he reads the letter, and reads the threat from the king of Assyria. And what does he do? He formulates a plan, creates this whole thing, going to go out and, and, you know, fight this war. Mm -mm. That's not how he handled it. He put on sackcloth and ashes. And here's what it says. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord, spread it out before the Lord, and Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. I love that imagery of where Hezekiah gets this letter, and it's the greatest problem he's ever faced in his kingship. And he takes that letter, and he goes to the temple, and he lays it before the Lord, and he's just like, this is my problem. What am I going to do? This is my problem. So he prays to the Lord, and he leaves that problem in the Lord's hands. And he goes back home. And God's answer to Hezekiah's prayer is greater than any he could have imagined. So what happens is the angel of the Lord went out that night and put to death 185,000 in the Syrian army. So when the people got up the next morning, there were all those dead bodies. So the king of Assyria returned to Nineveh and stayed there. God's solution was greater than any plan to come up with from Hezekiah for that problem. God's solutions for our problems are greater than any we could imagine. So why do we want to formulate a plan and then go, okay, God bless this plan? No, let's take it. Lay it before him like Hezekiah did and say, now what, Lord? Now what? So if you have a problem, anything going on in your life, maybe your whole life is unraveling. Maybe it's financial or physical or relational. Take it to the Lord like Hezekiah, and I promise you'll be amazed by what God does. Let us pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that you're a God, Lord, that is involved in the details of our life, from the smallest problem to the greatest problem. You are God, and we can take that before you and lay it out and say, help, Lord. So this morning, 
as we're sitting here, Lord, we lay those problems before you and ask you to do your will in our lives. Amen. All right, at this time, we'll send the children on up to Children's Church. Everybody else, let's stand up and wave at someone across the arena this morning. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, Jesus never opened his mouth. From the crown to the crucifixion, to the grave he was laid out. After three days in the garden tomb, I could hear the angels sing. As the lamb came forth as the lion, and the lion became the king. You won't find him again at the whipping post, standing there so me. He won't be nailed to the rugged cross, to his hands and to his feet. There'll never be another Calvary, cause I don't have to prove one thing. Day the Lamb became the Lion, and the Lion became the King. on earth with man by most he was rejected because he came forth as a lamb oh, but the day is soon approaching and every eye shall see the lamb in the line of judah has been crowned the king of kings you won't find him again at the whipping post standing there so me he won't be nailed to the rugged cross to his hands and to his feet there'll never be another calvary because he don't have to prove one thing Standing there so me He won't be nailed to the rugged cross To his hands and through his feet There'll never be another kind of Cause he don't have to prove one thing Day the Lamb became the Lion of the Lion became the King Day the Lamb became the Lion of the Lion became the King
chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns An ending love Like a flood, his mercies reign. Unending love and amazing grace. I think we all, have, conversation has been about the rain of last night, but this morning, it's my prayer that it will be our conversation when we leave here that the mercy of God will reign upon us. That's a good thing. That his grace, his unending grace, it will flood us, it will fill us, it will minister to us and give unto us. I really think that more than we want it, God desires to do it. Would it be all right if we just went to our Heavenly Father and asked him to do that to each one of us personally, to each one of us passionately, and each one of us powerfully, that whenever we leave here that we can say, wow. The very mercy of God rained on me. You know, in a downpour, you don't have to be there long to get wet. Mm. Are you ready? Is it what you want? I can't ask for you personally. You've got to ask for yourself. Let, let's just ask. God, we come to you, the God of mercy and the God of grace. The God of passion and the God of power. And Lord, today we just simply ask that your mercy, your ever unbelievable, undeserved mercy, that it would just rain down on us this morning. And Father, not only mercy, Lord, treating us and not giving us what our sins deserve, but Lord, also your grace, that it would give us the things that we don't deserve of goodness and of hope and of help, of love and of peace and of joy. So come, Holy Spirit, only you can do this. Come, Holy Spirit. We know you're present, Lord. You promised you'd be present, but now manifest yourself to us. We want to see you. We want to feel you. We want to experience you to the glory of your name and to the salvation of many. And, Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Graduated in 1974. We graduated on a Thursday night. I know you're amazed I graduated from anything, but I did. And so... Uh, Got up the next morning, had horses consigned to an auction in Nashville and left and got there Friday and there we had an auction Saturday and Sunday and, and came home and had my stuff all ready and I moved uh, on that Monday morning when I got home and moved to Cape after out here at Fruitland and uh, off 177 and lived with a veterinarian. Now I look back and that was, I, I loved the vet and his wife, I really, really did and still yet do, but, uh, but I'm telling you that was stupid to leave a house that was for free the best cooking in Missouri that was free and, uh, and to move off by yourself, but I did. And, and in that, there was a, Roy was a great vet, a great, he was an equine vet, and, uh, but he was just getting started. And so we, prosperity was not in our makeup. It, we just kind of did things the, the hard way. We drove an old 62 Chevy that was standard transmission. And half the time, she wouldn't, she wouldn't start. And so we'd park on the hill. Usually when we got any place, we'd park on the hill so we could roll down there and pop the clutch and get her started. Just That's kind of the high-class uh, uh, operation we had. But anyway, we didn't have running water at that time. We had an old chicken house, and it seemed a mile long. It probably, I don't know, it might have been 100 foot maybe. But we had to carry water to the horses uh, every day, at least three times a day, five-gallon buckets. And, and I could start on one end, and by the time I got to the other end, it would be lucky to be half full. I mean, I could just not, I couldn't pull it off very good. And so I had this trouble of, of, of having an empty bucket 
before I got to the end of the, of the hall. Sometimes my life is kind of like that with my bucket of joy. Sometimes I start early in the morning. I've had time with the Lord. I've had time to worship. I've had time in his word. Nobody's been up to bother me, to ask anything, to do anything. And, and I mean, I'm full of joy. But sometimes, by the time I get to the end of the day, to be honest, sometimes by noon, my bucket's not even half full anymore. The joy that I started with, the joy that I was experiencing, it was not the same joy when I got to the end of the day. And so what I'd like to speak to this morning, if you'll let me, that was, yes, sir, brother, preach on. I knew you had it down in there. You're so excited you couldn't get out. What I'd like to preach to is how to keep our bucket full all through the day, our bucket of joy. How to keep our bucket of joy all full, all through the day. So here I go. Are you ready? Philippians chapter 2, let me read a passage of Scripture. We'll draw some things from there, and I think, I believe, I'm trusting that God is going to speak to you and to me and to us. Listen as us read, starting in that 12th verse of the second chapter of Philippians. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on sacrifice in service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. There's an interesting verse in there. It says, you must continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to both will and to act according to his good purpose. Uh, and it talks about working out our salvation with, with fear and in trembling. And if you just take that at a glance, if you just take that and, and not think of the truth of the scripture of God, then, then you read that and think, well, Lord, somehow or another, I've got to work out my salvation. If I'm going to have a right standing with Heavenly Father, then I must do the work to earn that right standing. But if you took it like that, it is to deny the, the, the scriptures that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves nor of our works. That it's a, it's a grace gift unto us. It's something that we have not earned, that we have merited. If, if you've got to work out your salvation whenever we get there, some of the songs would be, oh, look what he has done. But the other songs would have to be, but also look at what I've done because I have earned it. I have worked for it. I have deserved it. And so, but whenever I read scripture, it says that all praise and all worship will be to the lamb that's seated on the right hand of the father that ever liveth to make intercession for us, who is our, who is our lawyer. He is our advocate advocate and all the praise and all the work glory and all the honor they go to him if we were doing even a part of it to earn it then part of that praise would have to go to whom us but I'm telling you none of the praise will go unto us isn't that great that whenever we go there that we will give him all the praise because he deserves all the praise because he died for all of our sins so if that's what that means then what does it mean to work out our salvation Work out our salvation. It's talking about, in this verse, there's a work that we must do, work out our salvation, but there's a work that he must do, that that we have indeed, that works in us. We work out the salvation he works within us. And and, and this is just a country boy's trying to explain the way I understand this, to make it work for me. I've had bird dogs in my life. I was cutting horses in my life. Accidentally, a time or two, I've had gated horses in my life. (laughs) Now, there's something interesting about all of those. You can take a bird dog, or you can take a dog, and you can hunt him, you can train him, you can work on him all you want. But unless God has put in that bird dog a nature that wants to smell and point birds, I'm telling you, you won't get it done. 
You just won't get it done. God put it in him, and as a trainer, we must help get it out of him. You can take a cutting horse with all kinds of cow that can do amazing things in front of a cow, but if he doesn't have that cow in him, you can't get it out of him. But if you've got him in him as a trainer, then, then you help that, that, that cow that is that cow sense that is within him, you help him get that out and help it get it out better. Even a gated horse, and I'll be honest, the smoothest thing to ride is a gated horse. Lewis, I'm turning over, brother. And, but it's the smoothest thing is to ride. But I'm telling you, you've got to help that gated horse that's got it in him work it out of him. When you go to the gyms to work out, you don't work out to get muscles. You work out to strengthen the muscles that you've got. Is any lights come on for anybody? <laughs> I'm bad at illustrations, okay? Whenever we get saved... Christ within us becomes our hope of glory. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth where in me. Whenever we come to faith in Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, moves in us, never to be taken apart from us. But as our job is to help him come out of us, to manifest himself through us, to find ourselves and our relationship with him to be strengthened and enlarged, we, have, we work out that salvation that's already ours. It's in us for our faith in Christ Jesus. Now we bring it out. Young little Miss Jaden, whenever she came to faith, Christ came to live in her heart, but for the rest of her life, she's going to be helping Christ that's now in her, that salvation that is now her, manifest itself out of us more and more. And God lives in us to give us the power to will and to do his good pleasure. Whew. Amen. Oh, aren't you glad you came? Five of you are. <laughs> yeah. That's it, guys. And so it is. There's joy in us. Why? Because Christ lives within us. Therefore, we have the fullness of Christ's joy living in us. There's not a one of us that doesn't seek to have more joy than we have. Not a one of us that want to have that to be the whatever people think of. So they're a person of joy. That, that's a goal that's within us. There's a desire within us now as believers that deep inside of us, we actually would like to have and experience and share joy in and through our life. What we need to do is learn then how to do it. And for the next few minutes, that's what I want to share from this passage is how then can we take the joy that's in us and help it to be manifest through us? Let me share a few things if we can. First of all, if we're going to be such a people that are walking in the joy, if we're going to be such a people that, that take heed to this whole book of Philippians, and the theme of this book is rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice that we will be a people of joy, then what are some of the things we can do to help us do that? Number one, we need to, no matter what this day, no matter what the circumstance, we need to remember that God is within us, that God is with us, and God is for us. That God is in us, that God is with us, and God is for us. Now you guys over in the shadows. And, and God that is in us, God is with us, and God is for us. No matter what's going on in your life, if you're on the mountaintop, God is in you as a believer. If you're on the mountaintop, God is with you as a believer. If you're on the mountaintop, God is for you. If you're in the depths of the valley, if you're in the deepest of pits, God is still in you. God is still with you, and God is still for you. Oh, what a difference that must make whenever we do that. Listen to what Scripture says, for God is always working in you. Woo, hallelujah. He's always working in you giving you both the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. There's always a God working in you to desire joy. There's always a God in you that will give you the power to rejoice in your life no matter what. Uh, last night was time to, I was just told Deb, so I'm going to sleep, I'm done. But I had to look in the closet downstairs and we were having a leak. Now, we don't ever have leaks in our houses, but, but I see this little old trickle of water. And, and there in the, in the closet, there's some blankets down in there, and they're sopping wet. And I rejoiced in the Lord. I did a jig. I was so happy. Woo, I'm telling you, I did. Now, you heathen, John might not have responded like, I'm telling you the truth. I wanted to cuss. <laughs> I don't know how, except I've heard y'all enough. I'm kind of learning. I mean, it was my first response. I was tired, and I was ready for bed, and I didn't want to deal with this. And then I remember, 
But Jim, you got to preach on joy in the morning. <laughs> it's amazing what you'll do if you're a preacher. And so I thought, well, you know, Lord, even in this, this is the first time we've ever had a rain that's leaked. Even in this, it's not that bad. It's just a few towels and a few blankets that got wet. Even in this, we put fan on it and it dried up and everything's cool after it quit raining. My house is also for sale slightly discounted because of rain not teasing. <laughs> See what I'm saying? All of a sudden, whenever I got backed in a corner with my very own words that I knew that I was going to preach to you, but also had been preaching to me, with my very own words, I reminded myself, Jim, what's the big deal? God is still with you. And God is not only still with you, but God is in you. He's in you. Christ within me is the hope of glory. I've always got hope that the glory, the reflection, the image of God might be seen shown to me and might be shown through me because Christ is living in me. Hallelujah. He's living in you. Thank you, Yvonne. Amen. He's living in us. Don't you ever forget it. And I know when you walked in here today, every one of us has some stuff in our life. Every one of us has some situations. Every one of us has some circumstances that want to bring you down, that want to hold you down. But you can find hope, you can find help, and you can find Christ's joy if you'll just realize that he is in me. And not only in me, but he is with me. Uh, I shared this the other day. Uh, my favorite friend, my best friend is my brother. Uh, he's been, he's three years older than I am, and we've just always been the best of friends. I grew up a stutter, and he was my interpreter and my bouncer. He would first tell them what I was trying to say, so he interpreted, and then if they laughed, he'd bounce them. You know what I mean? <laughs> just the way it was. And, uh, but nonetheless, we, we've been best of friends. But, but I always found this, especially as a kid. I get backed into corners and situations where you get a little nervous and all of that. But whenever he would show up, because he was older and bigger and stronger, whenever he'd show up, I would relax. Because I knew it was going to be all right, because he was with me. Can I tell you one that's much greater than my earthly brother? And that's my spiritual brother named Jesus. Always with me. Friend, no matter what you're going through today, he's in you on the inside. He's with you in front, behind, and beside you. But not only in you, not only with you, but he's for you. He could show up, but what good would it be for him to show up? He could be in you, but what good would it be for him to be in you if he wasn't for you? But I'm here to tell you, my friend, he is for you. If God be for you, then who can be against you? Amen. I don't care who or what or what circumstances coming against you. If God be for you, who can be against you? If you've got God, you and God make a majority in any situation, I'm telling you, God is for you. And not only for you, but he's able to do whatever need, needs done. What's impossible for man is possible with God. He's for you, and he's able to do more than you ask, think, or pray. That's our God, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, all that we pray, and all that we think. That's the God that's for you. So no matter what's going on today, I'm telling you to rejoice, my brother. And again, I say rejoice. Well, why? Because God is in you. God is with you. God is for you. When your joy seems to be diminishing, when your bucket seems to be spilling, I'm telling you to remember, remind yourself God is in you. He is with you, and he is for you. Number two, if we're going to be a people that learn to walk in the fullness of his joy, we need to learn to be grateful and never grumble. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. How many like to work beside a grumbler? Kobe, don't shake. That's good. You, you lowered your head. You did good. <laughs> she works with me. <laughs> How many like to, to work beside a grumbler? Just negative. Always talking about what's wrong. God said, if you want your joy to be full, if you want to be walking in the fullness of the, of the joy of Christ, then don't be a grumbler. Don't be an arguer. Choose the high road. 
choose the better road. You say, well, Jim, does that mean that we're not to pay any attention to what's going on in this world or got what's going on in my life or the people that you put in my life? I'm not saying that you can't discern. I'm not saying that you don't know the difference between right and wrong and good and bad and, and, and evil and godly. I'm not saying that. But let our conversation, matter of fact, it says, Jesus in Matthew, it says, we, he will, we will give an account for every careless word we have spoken. And some of those careless words that we speak are those grumbling words, those divisive words. I'm not saying that you cannot discern, but I'm saying that we need to choose our words wisely. It's like I come up to Teresa and say, Teresa, this old world, it's just falling apart. I'm 64, and I can never remember a worse condition that we're in than what it is right now in my life. It just seemed like it's falling apart. I, I mean, our political world, gee, give me a break. Kindergartners could do, I'm sorry, I got strength gone. You see what I'm saying? I could do that and just leave it like that. Have I spoke truth? Well, yes. But have I spoke encouragement, hope, or help? No. I've just grumbled. But I can start it like this, Teresa. I'm concerned about this world. I'm concerned about our nation. I'm concerned about our political outlook and what's going on in our world. And Teresa, so I'm just asking that you join me and let's increase our prayer life of praying for this situation. We talked about the same thing, used almost all of the same decisive, discerning words. But we didn't leave it with mere grumbling. We brought hope, we brought help, help, we brought heaven into the situation. Whenever I do, their life has been enriched when I leave, my life has been enriched. Is that a word? It is now. Enriching whenever I leave. I don't know if that really is a word. It's become richer. How's that sound? Whenever we leave. And that, my friend, is still being wise, still using your brain, still be discerning, but finding joy in that situation because we got hope. We've got help. So we don't choose to grumble. We don't choose to argue. We choose to always remember that he is in us, he is with us, and he is for us. And number three is we need to keep our conscience clean. Uh, Corey Tim Boone used to have a saying. She'd say, hey, are you fessed up to date? I like that. Are your confessions up to date? Scripture says it like this in Philippians 2. It says, you are to live clean and pure lives as children of God in a broken and a corrupt generation. You are to shine like stars and lighting up a dark world. Mm. So it is that we're to live clean and pure lives. We're to seek after that. We're to long for that. We're to live towards that. We need to be a people that, that I realize that we were saved from our sin. We're saved for the dead of our sin. We're saved for the power of our sin and, and, and the person of Satan of our sin. I, I agree with all that. But I'm telling you, we, we still yet sin as believers, do we not? Yeah, we do. If you've got any honesty at all in you, you know you do and we do. So what we've got to do is whenever we stumble, whenever we fall, that we don't just stay in that fallen condition, but that we get up. That we don't just stay in that, in that situation. We, we take care. We, we get ourselves cleaned up. And if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I love all of that. When, whenever we sin, and if a man tells you he won't sin, he'll lie about other things. Whenever we sin, we just need to confess it. And he'll be faithful. Faithful for what? And he'll be just. Just for what? He'll be faithful and just to not only forgive us of our sin, and, and I like that part, but he'll also cleanse us up. He will clean us. Uh, that's refreshing to me. That's invigorating to me. That it's God's job to clean me up. The confession restores my fellowship. My relationship has never been broken. He's still my father, seated upon the throne. He's still my God, and I'm still his. It hasn't hindered the relationship, but it has hindered the fellowship. 
And it's not that God has moved, but the fellowship has been hindered because in some area in our life, we have shrunk back from a close fellowship unto him. And that's what unconfessed sin does. It's not that God has anything to be ashamed of in himself. Not that God has done wrong in himself, but we have. And so therefore, rather than talk about it with God, we shrink back and distance ourselves in some degree, in some area of our life, we distance ourselves from the Lord. And when we do in that area, I promise you our joy will be diminished. But what God says is come. Come, and we can, we can find our sins removed. And it says this. It says, what, what happiness there is for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys whenever sins are covered over. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. If you want to keep joy in your bucket when you stumble, when you fall, when you sin, just go as quickly as you can to the holy and pure Father that will receive you with open arms. He'll forgive you of your sins and he will cleanse you up. And it might not be in a day, it might not be in a year, it might not be in five years, but he'll start a cleansing work in that area. Once you and he come into agreement, he's already right with you and the fact that he's a holy God, he's never moved. But now you've got yourself right in that fellowship relationship, part of your relationship, and he starts moving and changing you in that area of life, little by little, sometimes instantly, forgiven instantly, but sometimes the cleansing part it takes a little longer for us to, to move into him. And so it will increase our joy. One more verse that's there. It says, Happy are those who live pure lives, who follow the Lord's teaching, that keeping his rule, and who try to obey him with their whole hearts. I like that word, try. Our joy will become more whenever we're seeking, whenever we're trying to become holy and stay holy and pure before him. Amen. Keep yourself cleansed. Keep yourself clean before the Lord. Number four is we need to meditate and live out the word of God. It says that this in Philippians, it says that we're to hold tightly to the word of life. And this, my dear friends, it is the word of life. We need to open ourselves up to it and open it up. We need to read the Word of Life. We need to study the Word of Life. And there's a difference between that. We need to read the Word of Life. We need to study the Word of Life. We need to meditate upon the Word of Life. We need to practice this Word of Life. And oh, I'm telling you, as we do, it will change our life. The Word of Life is not only able to bring a man into salvation, but it's able to equip the man of God, the woman of God, the people of God. It's able to equip us unto every good work. This word will do it for us. If you're in the midst of that situation, whenever your joy has gone, I'm telling you, the way back to experiencing the joy of the Lord is run to the word of God. Let it cling to you and you cling to it. Put it in your mind and put it in your heart. Uh, for years, I would hear about people being depressed and I just didn't get it. I'm just telling you, I didn't. Thoughts came to mind, just just do it. Come on, get over it. That's, that's what went through my mind. Just be a man, you know, come on. That's just emotions. Can I tell you one day I got depressed? <laughs> it's kind of like people talking about a toothache. It's not bad till you get one. It's a season in my life. Whew. Dark season. That the biggest chore of the morning was to get my right leg out of the bed. Because if I got my right leg out, there's a chance I could get my left leg out. I tried to shake it off and man it off. I couldn't get rid of it. But finally I realized if I was going to get out, the Word of God was going to have to lead me out. So here's what I started doing. I got little post-it notes. I never was a computer, guys. I got banned from the church computer for a month. I thought that was a reward. <laughs> Never been that kind of guy. So I get these post-it notes, and whenever God would bring me a word that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, I'd write it out. And I'd carry it in my pocket. I'd put them on my windshield, da on my, you know, on the dash of my car. I'd put it there on my desk in the office. 
man, every time I'd feel those old depressive thoughts coming onto me, I'd bring it out and I'd replace it. Because you see, if you're depressed, that's because you've got depressed feelings, feelings of depression. And you've got feelings of depression because you're, you're thinking depressed uh, thoughts that are of depression. So what we've got to do, we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this will renew our mind. I'm telling you now, it will renew our mind. We've got to change our way of thinking. We've got to swap the stinking thinking for his thinking. And to do that, you've got to open up your life and open up your word, his word at the same time, and then start hiding that word in your heart that we won't sin against God. Let the word of God be a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. It will lead us out of that darkness. I'm telling you, Will, if you hide his word in your heart, it will change us. And in the area of joy or depression, there is a way out. A lot of help and a lot of helpers, and we need that. But I'm telling you, the greatest tool to have in that toolbox is to have the Word of God hidden in your heart. He got me out. To Him be the glory. And His Word saw me through it. And I'm telling you, if He can get me out, He can get you out too. His Word, run to the Word of God. And you say, well, Jim, I don't know what to do when I get there. Just start. It'll never start till you open it. He'll find you in this word. I promise if you'll just open it and get in it, he will find you. How does he do that? Just give me a, just give him a chance. Take me out my word. Just try him out. Say, God, I'm coming to your word and I'm not leaving until I start getting a bite of something from you. Taste and see that not only is he good, but his word is good. My friend, we don't have to stay there. I'm talking to somebody today. The depression is ruling. It doesn't have to rule your life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not going to say it's going to be instantly. Open up your heart and your mind to the Word of God and say, Speak to me. And you just watch and you just wait. If you'll stay in the Word, the Word will start to get into you. And it'll set you free. Now, I know it took a little time there, but I feel like I'm supposed to do that. Somebody needed to hear that. In closing, if you want to keep the joy in your bucket, we need to learn to serve our God. Amen. The longer I serve him, that old song goes, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, the more love that he bestows. It, it sounds opposite. If, if you want to do joy, then you need to be concentrating, working on yourself and make certain that you've got all that joy. One well, of the greatest things we can do is learn to serve others. And as we take the focus off of us and our situations and put our focus on others and their needs and start living to serve them, somehow or another we find that scripture to be true that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Whenever we start giving out the things of joy, whenever we become a servant, whenever we choose to rejoice in the lives of others, that joy and that blessing will come back on us. Several years ago, I was pastoring a church, and there's a lady that's in our church, a, a neat lady, and didn't really know her that well at the time, just started pastoring. But I would notice that uh, oftentimes that she would just leave in the middle of a service, and I didn't know. I was kind of a new pastor there. I thought, man, if I said something wrong, am I, you know, you just think those thoughts. And, uh, and they were going through me. And so one day, she stopped me. She said, Jim, you probably noticed that from time to time that I just leave she got to sharing her life story and she had a teenage daughter that took her own life he said Jim for me that the greatest way I can overcome that tragedy in my life is to serve others and so sometimes whenever I'm in a place or sometimes whenever I'm at church and it just seems like I'm overwhelmed with that feeling of depression and sorrow and loss so I found if I'll get up and go to a shut-ins home and minister to them I win the battle rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice there's joy in Christ Jesus our Lord in every day in every situation David Allen's always got this saying, from, from my birth till I leave in a hearse, there's never a day that it couldn't be worse. 
Amen. If you'll look, if you'll look, he's always in you as a believer. He's always with you as a believer. He's always for you. If you'll choose your words wisely, discern the truth absolutely, yes, but choose your words rightly. and Don't let the words of grumbling and griping and negativity be your word, not be your closing words. Always speak words of hope and of help. If we'll keep ourselves clean before the Lord, we're going to stumble, we're going to fall. When we do, just own it before the Lord and let him cleanse you up. He's the the cleaner upper. If we'll open up our hearts and our lives to his word and serve others, I'm telling you, you're going to be amazed when you get to the end of the day, you still got joy in your bucket. That's God's desire for you, and I believe even your desire for yourself. I say let's practice it. Amen. Can I close in prayer? Father, we come to you now this morning, and Lord, we're thankful to be yours. Thankful, Lord, that not only you love us, Lord, but you love us well, and you love us always. Father, we thank you that in you, no matter what the situation, we can find hope and help. We can find something to rejoice in. Rejoice in Christ Jesus, because you are our joy, Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, take this message, deliver it to us as we need. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.